loan sharks and middlemen and gangsters and corruption. And it's a crazy drug. Coffee is the drug trade. You can like, introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, my name is Michael Wood. I'm the director of a charity from the United States called Philanthropy. F-I-L-A-N-T-H-R-E. Uh, yeah, we've been working in the coffee industry. Well, me personally, I've been doing it for 15 to 16 years. And uh, we work in India, Indonesia, Laos, and Vietnam. Uh, we've been there for the past seven, seven years. What? You want to join? Okay. Um, yeah, uh, we work with indigenous ethnic minority smallholders. So that's coffee farmers that have really basically less than four hectares, or sorry, two hectares, or about four and a half acres. Um, they're predominantly the coffee producers of the world. So about 78% of all coffee farmers are smallholders uh, and indigenous ethnic minority. It's very profitable. There's a lot of money to be made in coffee, especially if you're on the downside of it, or the downstream, we call it. So upstream is from farmers all the way to uh, the middlemen and the factories that, that make it and then get it into unroasted coffee form and get it to a port. And that's upstream, getting it up to the stream. And then downstream is getting it into a consuming country like uh, anywhere in North America, Europe, um, Australia, you know, anywhere that's not growing coffee. They take it and then it's downstream from there. And that's you know taking the green beans, roasting it, packing it, brewing it, selling it, um, that's downstream. So there's yeah. massive amounts of money to be made in that part of it. And very little money to be made on the upstream, so the actual growing of it. And so of course you're gonna have more businesses. I mean, how many, how many people do you know have started a cafe or they really liked coffee so they started a cafe and a little bakery and this and that. And, and you can have hundreds of them. I mean, in Germany you have more than 500 coffee roasters in a relatively small country, but that's how pervasive coffee is. There's demand for it anywhere, even here. Everybody still drinks coffee. I mean, you're talking about uh, 40 to 50 percent of all people drink coffee. In Lao. No, in the world. In the world. I mean, every day you have something like seven to eight billion cups of coffee consumed. That's a lot per day. What? How much? Seven to eight billion cups of coffee are consumed on a daily basis. So it's this massive engine. Uh, so that's why it exists everywhere. Uh, now coffee's been spread usually by colonialization. Um, so for instance, one of the largest producers historically uh, was, let's say, Indonesia. But Indonesia was colonized by the Dutch and coffee was put in by the slave trade. So Dutch colonialists in massive farms had Indonesian slaves and they grew coffee. Yeah. Now of course slavery in its traditional form has died out, but the coffee's still there, and the market's still there, and the trade relationships are still there, and, yeah. and this is for like six or seven hundred years that coffee Addiction trade is still there. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't go away. It's a crazy drug. Coffee is the drug trade. There's no other way to, to describe it more perfectly than just saying it's the drug trade. It has all the the same, one which is illegal. Uh, legal. Yeah, this is a legal drug trade, but it still has all the same tenets of the illegal drug trade. So you look at cocaine or opium, and you have loan sharks and middlemen and gangsters and corruption and it's all there it's all there it's the same thing it's just legalized drug trade it's crazy um, and it's it's getting to the point where you know it's so pervasive and it's so big that there really needs to be a solution if we're gonna have coffee for the next generations uh, I can't keep going on like this like we're losing land, the climate is shifting, uh, certain areas can grow, can't grow, it's changing every year, um, and people are like, oh, well, you know, everybody will just adapt, but the hard part is that people don't know what the, the farm level situation, the smallholders, the people, the 80% of the people that are producing it, like, what is their condition, because they are not resilient, they can't handle How even much? the most basic fluctuation in, in markets or prices or this or that. Um, and even the price you pay per cup doesn't resonate with farmer income. Like maybe this year uh, the price of coffee goes up 10 cents or 5 cents. That doesn't mean that more is going to the farmer. Like if you look historically for coffee prices, um, I mean it's very, it fluctuates wildly. It goes up, it goes down, up, down, up, down, up, down. But consumer prices rises. 
it's always been rising. Mm -hmm. It just keeps going up. But market prices do this. It doesn't correlate like what yeah. the consumer pays versus what the actual producer gets paid. And that's a crazy thing because you look at the same prices that are being paid for coffee now are the exact same prices that were paid in 1975. But costs of production have gone up. It costs more to buy fertilizer, or it costs more to buy tools, or if you're hiring labor, labor costs go up because relative costs of living, inflation, all these other things increase. Oh, so really? the cost of producing coffee is going up and the price stays the same. It's an insane function. But, I mean, you see this in cacao, you see it in rice, sugar, tea, spices, but when you get down to the small farmer who doesn't have massive amounts of quantity where they can they can sell at a low price but still make a lot of money you know you're talking about economies of scale you're talking about one little small family which is the majority of coffee production they don't have enough to be able to bargain or make it when you're saying oh for every ton of coffee i make 50 us dollars mm, like, a, a small ton. family is making a ton of coffee you in know, a year or what? Yeah, yeah in a year and that's i mean here in in lao that's 98 percent of their income and so then you start to look at the economy of it, you're like, uh, this is not sustainable. And even if that were sustainable, because you could say, oh, well, you know, they're, they're tribal people, they can live off the land. Okay, fine. But that's, they can't thrive. There are still aspirations for families. They want their children to be able to go to school. They want to be able to study. But there's people out there that want to be doctors and come back to their families because there's pervasive sickness in communities and they have no medical health care access. There are people that want to be biologists so that they can understand plants better because they're, I mean, they're farming societies. They're, they've been tied to the soil for thousands of years. That's a sacred thing. They would love to understand it more from a scientific point of view. And they expect to go to school. I mean, there's so many of the families that we work with that haven't finished the fourth grade. And it's not because they don't want to, it's because they can't afford to continue on. And so it's like you have this incredible need and an incredible lack of access to value for something that we consume on a daily basis, and we pay a lot of money for it. Like we as consumers pay a lot of money for that good, but less than 1% of the money we pay as a consumer actually goes back to the producer. And that's a crazy concept because coffee is in the top three most difficult crops to grow, the most labor-intensive crops. Really? You have cotton, tobacco, and coffee. Those are the top three most labor-intensive crops. And you have this immense labor going into producing something, coffee, which they're not even drinking their own coffee. Yes. The people we work with, we teach them to be able to understand their own coffee, how to read what's going on with their soil. There are many things that can be gleaned from coffee, but the majority have no clue. They don't know that the roasted coffee that they're drinking, this instant Nescafe coffee, is their coffee. Or they don't even know that what they're producing is that. They have no concept of that. They don't know no, where that, it's going. Coffee. And they're like, well, no, 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 no. I sell, I sell coffee beans. Like, yeah, but that's the coffee you drink. They're like, no, 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 it's different. Like, no, but it's it's really the same thing. And you have to sit down and take their beans. Uh, I mean, basic communities will sit there and, and will start just harvesting coffee cherries harvest the coffee cherries, process them, dry them, cure them, clean them, roast them, brew them, and be like, see, this is coffee. And like, wait a minute, but how much coffee goes into this one cup? And then you can show them, like, okay, so so many grams of coffee goes into this one cup, and you paid that much for this, so if you calculate it, the per kilogram price is this. Like, what? I get nothing. I get, truly, like I get nothing for this. You're like, yeah, and you're doing seventy to eighty percent of the work too. I mean, that's crazy. Seventy to eighty percent of the work. Is, yeah. I mean, because to go from let's say, uh, not even cherry. I mean, let's it's just talking about how do we get from soil that has no coffee to a cup of coffee? Yeah, I mean. So you have land. Now, most likely, uh, at least here, they preserve a lot of the forest, so they plant it in the forest, which is beautiful. Uh, it'd be lovely if that could economically make sense. And it can, but that's a later conversation. You have land, plant some trees. Now, that's all money, that's labor. Planting three, 4,000 trees per hectare. Uh, you need to raise the seedlings, so you have to buy seed, raise the seedlings, put fertilizer, make compost, put that in the bag, grow it for six to eight months, tend to every single seedling, check every seedling to make it healthy. Because if you plant a sick tree, you have 80% chance that three years later, it's gonna die. So you're caring for the seedling, 
and you plant it. Now again, there's no income coming yeah, out. Yeah. This and is and all even the labor. risk of and some nature um, threats. Yeah. And so that's just planting the seedling. Now you have to wait four years for any harvest to come out. Four years. Four years. And that still means that you have to fertilize, you have to prune, you have to take care of the trees, you have to combat disease and pests, or I wouldn't necessarily say combat because you can work with natural systems to just keep it resilient. But and that's what they do, Alpha? Uh, that's what we train. We train a lot of these techniques to teach them. It's low external input agriculture. So um, identifying resources that they have around them that they usually tend to look at as waste. And like that's some of your most powerful resources <laughs> to be able to not only reduce costs of production, but to maintain healthy soil and a healthy environment. Uh, but they do that for four years. And then finally they get a crop. And then you'll have to harvest the cherries. So you'll say you'll have 6,000 kilograms of cherry in a small farm, maybe six to 7,000 kilograms. And you have to harvest it one by one by hand. You can't strip like this, mm -hmm. otherwise you get bad quality. So you harvest cherries one by one. You can do maybe 30 to 50 kilos a day per person. So it's a very slow going process. It takes about three months to properly do it. Um, and not only that, but after the day when you're done harvesting, you have to take it home. You have to pulp and take off the fruit. So there's yeah. a fruit covering off the cherry. And then you have to put it into a tank. You have to ferment it. So you add water and you let the sugars naturally ferment to take the sticky substance off the coffee cherry. You do that for 24 hours, but you have to stir it every hour, monitor the temperature, monitor the pH to make sure that you don't create a bad coffee. Then you have to rinse it, and then you have to dry it, and you have to stir it every 15 minutes for two weeks during the day, just to make sure that it dries slowly, properly, to maintain the quality. And then while you're doing that, you're also sorting out defective beans that may have gotten into that. Then when it's dry, you have to store it and kind of rotate the bags, because they'll be dry, but the water's not stable. It's not properly cured. So you have to cure the beans over the course of one to two months, you have to keep it away from any smells that are bad. So if you cook a fire, immediately your coffee will smell and taste like smoke because coffee is like a sponge. It absorbs everything. So you have to have a specific place, which usually means that people have to build a specific place to keep their coffee separate from their household, which is a huge cost if you're only making $90 a year. And then you have to rotate the bags so that the water kind of balances out and becomes stable. So every four or five days you have to rotate bags and transition this stack and that's while you're picking and while you're processing and then after that you have to go and you have to mill it and so then you have to transport the beans to the mill and then you have to peel off this outer covering which leaves you with the green bean so I can show you this real quick hold on yes it'll take me five seconds so this is kind of just showing you here but you have the fruit covering which we take off and after you ferment it and get rid of this sticky substance, you have this thing called parchment. And so this is what you're curing for a month. You're rotating tons of this, well, probably like 1.5 tons of this. And then what you do is you put it through a machine which takes off this cover, ah. and then it polishes the bean, and then you're left with unroasted coffee. But there's still a massive amount of defects in here. So then after that process, and you sort it by size, you put it through density separation, um, and you're tasting this every few weeks to make sure that you're not doing anything bad. After that, then you have to sit down and pick out all the defects by hand. And that will take you one to two weeks of just sorting beans. And then, and only then, do you maybe have a good coffee? Yeah, if you do something wrong of all these steps, there's about 126 control, quality control checkpoints before it even reaches a roaster. So and, and you have farmers trying to, with very little access to tools, a lot of the times very little access to information, they have to go through 120 quality checkpoints. Any one of those is screwed up, you lose, you know, you can be up to half, if not almost all of the value of your, of your harvest. And there are a lot of people that are very happy to not have farmers know these steps because they can take it from an early stage and do it themselves and then earn all the value. And so the farther up you get, of course, the more money you earn. But companies love to keep farmers even uh, at the fruit stage, working with the market, which is exports, getting to this grated green beans. But then you can only be paid so much for just how a bean looks. So. 
usually what the market pays for is how big are the beans, how green are the beans, um, you know, what's the density of the beans, what's the amount of water that's inside of the beans, so what's the moisture content, and what's the basic smell of the green beans. And that's how you value coffee. But when you drink it as a consumer, you're drinking it because of how it tastes, how it smells. That is not factored into farmer pricing. I mean, it is in some relationships. We can talk, you know, there's direct trade and, and things where people go to the farm and then taste their coffee and say, it's great, I'll buy it. There's still problems with that. But in majority, farmers are paid only on the physical attributes, meaning how it looks. And they're like, okay, it's clean coffee. I'll give you the market price, which is right now, uh, it's like $1.32 per pound. So you're thinking as a consumer, you buy specialty coffee, maybe you're paying $20 a pound, $25, $30 a pound for really high quality coffee. There's a good chance that the farmer received mm, probably less than 70 cents per pound for that. Um, that's usually how it works. But this is usually a lack of access to knowledge and information. So we spend a lot of time teaching them what all of these things mean. And most importantly, what consumers are looking for in a coffee. Teaching yeah. them what does a coffee taste like, what are consumers looking for. You may not like how this tastes, but the consumers are the ones that are sending the money. So, what do they want to get? And when you can understand that, it's like, now you can understand how your coffee is worth $10 a kilo, or let's say $5 a pound, $6 a pound, $7 a pound, not 70 cents. But that requires the farmer's understanding. What is coffee? Yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of people that don't want that to happen. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, again, it's a drug But you, you, found, you found a way that you can even pay them $10 a pound. Yeah, because they have Can you coffee. tell about this, this trick uh, I mean, well, this is not a trick. There's, there's two different things. So our charity runs a very unique program. But even beyond that, there's just something, you know, specialty coffee, the best coffees in the world, right? Uh, the best coffee in the world is somewhere between 0.1 and 1% of all coffee in the world. Very, very little amounts of it. But it's the fastest growing segment in the world. So more and more people are drinking specialty coffee than any other market. It grows faster than instant coffee, than just pure roasted coffee. It grows faster than ready-to-drink drinks faster than cold brew, specialty coffee consumption is increasing faster than any market. The only thing is there's a lot of specialty coffee companies, so there's not a lot of supply left. So prices naturally have to go up. But the only thing is, how do you get your coffee into that market? And that's where I've spent the past 15 years is, I mean, of course, I'm working on agriculture science, all these different things, but I've been in the industry for 15 years and I know who's there and how to connect with them. And so we provide that connection for the people we work with. It's like, if you have the best coffee in the world, we know exactly who will take it, and we know exactly what it's worth, and it's not a negotiation at that point, because they know they need it, they know it's good, we know how good, know how good it is, the farmers know how good it is, so it's not like, how cheaply yeah. can I get this? It's yeah. like, no, how much can you afford to pay for this coffee? Because you know that, through us, you directly can pay these farmers, direct. Not through cooperative, where maybe it gets them, or little pieces fly off here and there. No, 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 it's direct to that family that grew this coffee. And then it's more of like, okay, companies are willing to spend more because they want to continue to work with these families. You taste a good coffee, you want it again, your customers want it again, how can we keep this going? The way to do it is to have people actually feel dignified enough to keep doing this, to want to do better, to want to grow better coffee, to want to produce better, blah, blah, blah. So that's not very hard. Uh, the quality speaks for itself. So you don't have to convince too much when the quality is that great. Um, and Lao coffee is fantastic. The Indonesian coffees we work with are fantastic and people don't see these qualities coming from these countries ever. This is the first time they've ever had this quality. Oh, these are new origins. Like, yeah, they've been there for hundreds of years, but this quality does exist <laughs> if they have ethical access to a market. Oh, okay. We'll do that. So, yeah. yeah but uh, you told also about the thing that you kind of um, donate them mm. and they donate you coffee back so you're not really buying it. Yeah. This is this trick where you also can uh, reach a better price for them, mm. isn't it? Yeah, I mean, uh, what you're talking about is a program that, that we pioneered. Uh, it's called Gift Exchange. It was actually named Gift Exchange by this, uh, uh, this colleague of ours. Uh, her name is Dr. Vandana Shiva. We met with her um, and had uh, a lot of talks about how gift exchange, then it was just our program, we didn't know what to call it yet, but she named it, this is gift exchange. Okay. Fine. Um, but that program involves uh, trying to 
decommodify coffee. And now that sounds really weird, but what I mean by that is, as a consumer, you go and you buy this, and you're buying this, and it's just this, and maybe it says the farmer's name, and maybe it says the country, and maybe it says where it comes from, and oh, okay, it has cup notes. But you're still buying this. If this is not available for that farmer, if that farmer doesn't have coffee in front of you, then you would have no reason to interact with that farmer in your mind. Like, okay, uh, my relationship to that person is coffee. That's it. That's it. And when you start to look at that relationship, there's this fundamental unethical part of this relationship with a good like this. Because then you literally are using a farmer to get coffee. You're not you're not looking at the farmer in and of itself and saying, I want to work with you, farmer, and the result is this. It's like, no, 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 I want you to work to get this so that I can buy this. If you don't have this, then I don't speak with you. But these farmers, when you look where they live, especially the indigenous ethnic minority people, they live on the edges of all of these forests, like some of the most important ecological resources for the people. It's like, your relationship with these people, whether you like it or not, is not just through coffee. They are also basically on the front lines. They are the people on the edge of the forest that happen to usually grow the best coffee. Because Protected. you have like virgin, awesome forests that are growing beautiful coffee. But they're basically the protectors of the forest. Because if they can't afford or they lose their land, they have to cut more land down because they still need to survive and produce coffee. So if they can survive, they don't need to cut down more land. And they would love to be able to protect their forest they because the people- They have a relationship. They have a relationship. Uh, I would say of all the communities we work with, 100% of them uh, have animist beliefs. They believe that the soil, the trees, the animals are sacred. And they want to protect that. But when you're fighting to feed your family, when you're fighting to just have enough rice to eat, it becomes hard. So the idea is to change your relationship where you're not valuing this like your relationship to coffee this is not the most valuable part of the relationship in coffee production your most valuable relationship is with that family that's producing it because they're yes producing coffee but they're also protecting the environment that we're all a part of and they're the best ones to do it because they are the people that are responsible for either protecting or destroying the forest it's like okay so then what am i going to do all right don't value the coffee value the community you can empower a community by valuing uh, or by you know enjoying their coffee by consuming their coffee but what if there is a way to not buy this You're like you know what all the money that I spend on this one thing what if I could just give the money to the family and the community directly like, what if what if that could exist and what if that family could say thank you like, they can't come to your house they can't shake your hand, they can't give you a hug, they can't call you on the phone, but they can do one thing, they can send you a gift. And that gift happens to be some of the best coffee on the planet. So, if you could do that, if you could say, uh, for this I'm gonna spend normally $3. Like, no, 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 no. Because we know where this comes from, who it comes from, because we have traceability down to every single human that we work with in, in our charity. We could say, actually, you know what? You're not buying this coffee at all. This is not for sale. They're not selling it to you. But if you want to support that family, that family can give you a thank you gift. Say thanks with their coffee. And we as a charity can roast it, prepare it, send it. We become effectively not, not a coffee company. We become stewards. We become protectors of their gift. All we do is we hold their gift for them. And when somebody wants to donate to that family, we are authorized by that community to release their thank you gift directly to the donor. And so then, drinking coffee in and of itself becomes a philanthropic action. You change the whole nature of the relationship. You're not buying coffee, you're supporting a community. 100%. It's traceable. You can see exactly what your money that you would normally spend on coffee, what it actually does to improve a life. So we've done this before where uh, one family, they had a ton of coffee. But all you needed was 300 kilos. So 0.3 tons. We gift exchanged that with, um, it was about 1,100 people. It took eight hours. Now that eight or that 300 kilograms would normally be worth about mm, $1,000. For, for, for the buyer? For, for the, the family. They would maybe get $1,000 from that 300 kilos, maybe. That's all it was worth. Yeah. 
But when we gift exchange, when they say, no, 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 I'm not buying this, but I want to support that family with what I would normally spend on this, I'm giving it to them for development programs. Yeah, how much is that? Uh, we raised 36,000 US dollars in eight hours. And that was one family with 0.3, like 30% of their harvest, one family brought an entire village out of loan shark systems, completely yeah. out of the illegal debt, the illegal lending systems. That's uh, a big it, difference. <clears throat> yeah, a whole little community. I mean, it was uh, 10 families, but, but still, one tiny little eight hour transaction of what normally would happen on any given day was able to lit literally take 10 families out of this crazy uh, loan shark, well, it's debt slavery, but bring them out of debt slavery. Just like that. And consumers did it. And then you're like, actually, you did this for that family. You provided so many meals for this family that they wouldn't have been able to buy. These kids went to school. They could go to higher education. These ones actually had health care. This is what happened, not by doing anything different, just drinking coffee, but changing your relationship with it. Making it's like coffee 10 times more valuable. Yeah. And it's not like anybody lost money. It's the same value chain just flipped. But on its where head. does the money go? Is in the, the wrong way? So, uh, normally, you mean in a normal yeah. relationship? So, what would normally happen is, so by D, you would have, this bean would be sold for about $3 a kilo. This would go to a roaster who would buy it for probably $3.25 or $3.50. They would roast it, and it would be effectively a cost of like $4, maybe $4.20. And they would immediately sell it for about $30 to $40 a kilo. So the the seller are getting all the money. Usually. But in, the, in this case, we offer something different. We can be, I mean, we work you on everything. You might make all the we, other steps. We yeah. do all the steps. We fill in all the gaps. And slowly over time, the community itself can fill all of these knowledge gaps. The idea is not for us to be a permanent institution. The idea is when they see how this works and they want to do it, we have the experience to be able to do all of these steps. And so wherever they're at, they take over those functions for sure. If they can't do it yet, we take over those functions while slowly training them to take those positions over. So eventually they can be going to whatever stage they want in coffee production. If they want to sell roasted coffee, they know how to do that. If they want to set up a cafe like this, they have a cafe and they can roast. Um, if they just want to trade green beans, then we know how to help them to maximize each and every stage. But to be able to get there requires a lot of investment, a lot of uh, tools, a lot of training, a lot of knowledge. So until that happens, we have gift exchange. People yes. can say, I don't want to buy coffee anymore. Yeah. Like, I still want to drink coffee, but I don't want to buy it. I want that money that I spend, which and you look at somebody from the United States or Europe, you're looking between 1,200 to 1,600 euros a year is spent on coffee. But if you actually could gift exchange 12 to 1,600 euros a year, one person could bring a family of six completely out of this debt slavery cycle. They could have their own machinery. They could have training. They'd be making their own fertilizers. They could be diversifying their income because that little bit of money goes a very long way when you're dealing with this kind of situation. You're like An individual consumer can change an entire community. Yes. It's crazy. Yeah. And the only, work with it like that? the only, the only um, position who loses the money are the sellers like Starbucks and all these Yes and no. I mean, companies are. You're talking about very small things. I mean, this is not about permanently shifting the structure to be that way, unless humanity said that's what we want to do for the rest of eternity. Fine, <laughs> but even uh, even if we do this, people would say, "Oh, but you're competing with Starbucks and Nestle and all that." Yes and no. What we can do is we can incubate communities, work with them, teach them all these tools, so that at least if they're working with Starbucks or Nestle which is wanting this, because they want to roast it and earn the money, at least when they get to this stage, they're secure. Meaning, coffee production by itself is not a lot of money. No matter what, if you have one or two hectares, which is the average farmer out there, max you could earn doing this if you're selling the best coffee on the planet. You're looking at maybe, let's take one and a half hectares, you're looking at maybe ten to eleven thousand dollars a year with about three thousand, four thousand dollars cost. So you're looking at like five or six thousand dollars a year. And that's usually for a family of six to seven. So you're looking at maybe a thousand dollars per person. So even with the best specialty coffee, you, you can survive but you can't thrive. Sure. Right? You can't move, you, you can't you can't take your family and say the next generation's gonna be better off than myself. 
you just can't through coffee alone. So what we can do with gift exchange is work with, uh, with communities and teach them how to diversify income, how to grow uh, organically, completely organic, how to recycle waste streams that, that, are, that should be recycled, that can be turned into income. So 80% of coffee production is waste. But this waste is a great source of feed for animals. It's a great source of feed for, or, uh, sorry, fuel, like clean cook stoves. Most people uh, burn charcoal in their house and are breathing smoke that yeah. has high levels of carbon monoxide and benzene and carcinogens. And you see, you know, that's all they can afford because they can't afford gas. But you have this covering on this beam, yeah. which can be turned into a pellet and burned in a cook stove that is clean burning, has almost no CO. It's well below World Health Organization guidelines as a clean cook stove. And, and the make, making of this pellet is very this. easy. Very easy. Just pressing. And when you're done burning it, you're left behind with this thing called biochar. Huh. So it's this beautiful, almost like activated charcoal that can go into your composting systems. Or you can use it for clean water filtration, which will also per, uh, pull out lead, mercury, cadmium, arsenic from, from wastewater. So really? you have these stacking functions in waste streams that they already have. Wow. Then you have, of course, the pulp, which can be fermented and fed to an animal. So like, you can raise pigs off of fermented coffee pulp and the, the, other, the other crops. So like, you have ground cover that's uh, yeah. leguminous or, or let's say, um, most likely it's a peanut, a ground peanut, but that takes nitrogen from the air and yeah. puts it into the soil. So it's fertilizing for you. You have shade trees that provide shade in areas for birds, but it's functional. This can be used as a feed. And so all of a sudden, you're able to recycle all of your wastes into raising animals that have no feed cost. And the animals themselves are raised without antibiotics, hormones, without, uh, without any smell, without flies. You have these living systems that do not produce waste. You're capturing all your waste streams. When you do that, you start earning more off of the waste than you do the coffee itself. The coffee could earn per hectare about 15 to 20,000 US dollars. That's at market price just from their waste. And you're like, all right, you could earn more off of your waste than this. Wow. And so all of a sudden you have a family that could be earning about $30,000 a hectare. Now when you talk about $30,000 for a small farmer, you're well beyond middle income. Yes. But it's completely organic. It's a holistic system. There are tenants of biodynamics, there's tenants of permaculture, there's ten uh, tenants of agroecology, uh, lysis systems, low, exter uh, low external input sustainable agriculture. And it's not too but much to learn. You can shift to it's that very in simple. Yeah, you but can. nobody looks at it that way. The coffee industry has not looked at it uh, really the, using the pulp as an integrated system for smallholders. Yeah, the coffee the industry is not interested. They're not. They're not because again, their focus is this. That's it. They want this because that's how they make money. They don't know how to value waste streams. And probably it's even more beneficial if the the, the producers are poor and. Actually, this is where it gets crazy, which is why I say we don't work against the big companies because when you start to value the waste streams, because we do this in Laos and Vietnam, but when you value the waste streams, all of a sudden you can see that the pulp is your most valuable thing, you know, the skin. Like, hmm. But to make it more valuable, you need the most ripe skin you possibly can get. Right. Because ripe fruits has better sugar, better protein, it's a better feed for animals. All right. And when you start generating revenue off of your wastes, that's the best thing you can do is is increase the quality of your feed for that system. Yeah. So you pick better cherry. You're not motivated to try and pick better cherry because you're hoping for a better price for coffee. You just want the right cherry and you end up with amazing coffee. So like in <laughs> Vietnam when they did it, you were starting off with coffee that was barely commercial grade. Like you would really not want to drink it. You'd taste it and be like, mm, <laughs> all right. And then once we started valuing the waste streams, you had coffee that was so good you didn't even have to go through all the machinery that most coffees have to. You don't need a density sorter, you don't need a screen sizer. Uh, it's, you have no defects. Actually we had less than 0.5% defect and that's doing nothing except for the fruit. So they were harvesting perfect coffee because they wanted the pulp. And so why, they're motivated why by a different, a different reason but then you're talking about Nestle, Starbucks, all these people can get way better quality way better quality and actually you can start to be more competitive with your pricing. You'd be like, actually, you know, this year uh, we want to pay six dollars a kilo instead of seven and a farmer could be like, meh, all right, because they're earning two to three times more off of their waste anyway, so it's, this becomes secondary. And that's and where you start powerful. to see real, like, real freedom in the market. Yeah. Like, 
you see quality on the whole start to increase globally if that kind of concept can can begin to flourish. And so these are the kinds of things that people donating to the families that we support and doing the gift exchange, drinking their coffee through that gift exchange system, that's what you're starting to do. You're starting to incubate those communities to be able to be like, all right, we're not going to become reliant upon coffee on struggling. Like, this can be a tool that we use to really build strength and, and to build, uh, in some communities, a sense of autonomy. Because as of now, they struggle to produce this, but that's all they have. And you're like, this is your greatest asset if we look at it in a different light. Yes. Um, so that's what we spend a lot of time doing. And gift exchange empowers that very directly. Yeah. Um, wow. And that's not all. I mean, you have healthcare systems. Uh, you have people that want to build out agriculture research centers for their own communities. Um, small amounts of coffee can do all of that. You're looking at the average small roaster uh, will roast about 36 tons, so that's two containers of coffee. It's a lot of coffee, but that's an average small roaster. It's easy to go through in one year. But that re represents $2 million. And if that's going back to the communities, you're talking about a village that maybe has only received, uh, let's say on the whole, you know, let's say about $100 per ton, $200 per ton. So you're looking at maybe $8,000 in profit, and then all of a sudden you're like, we have 1.5 million US dollars. We can build our own hospital. Mm. Okay, we can build our own clinics. Uh, okay, everybody can have clean water. Everybody can have this, can have that. Um, so it's not something where gift exchange just dumps money on a community. Not like, here's $1.5 million. It's held in a trust. They're the determine, uh, they determine how it's used. So we practice something called asset-based community development. But the community forms their own groups. They're not, they're not stupid. These are the most beautifully brilliant communities. They see the world in a different light, but they know what they need. Like, they just have no access or any opportunity to do these things. But you get people together and say, all right, if, uh, if money was not an issue, what, what would you do for your own community? Yeah. And so commonly it's like, Health insurance. We want health insurance. That's the first thing that almost every community is like. We want access to health care or health insurance. So it's like, okay, if if philanthropy could do the gift exchange for 36 tons, and that's one village. One village could be like, all right, we now have our own hospital that is funded by ourselves. It's an amazing they don't have concept. To pay back any loan, and, and it's the same amount of money, and it already exists, and people are already drinking it. It's just. It, it's just reevaluating the this this value chain and valuing people, not coffee. But you still get the coffee, and you tend to get better coffee, and it's tax deductible. It's like the thousand dollars you spend on coffee, you can write that off in the end of the year the taxes because you didn't spend it on coffee; you spent it on development. You're like, wait, what? Nice. And so then all of a sudden, the coffee consumer becomes the change. You're saying, how can consumers do it? Do that very specific function. The consumers are. The change. They can actually change the world. Whereas as of right now, certification, this and that, is completely problematic. And no matter who you talk to, uh, it would be very hard to find somebody who would say that certification is the answer. Or even right now in the coffee industry, direct trade, it's not the answer. It's still problematic because again, it focuses on one thing. This is all the relationship is. But with the concept of gift exchange where you value a human more than the coffee and you empower them through your consumption of this, very different. Then the consumer makes the change. And I mean if if you know this is an if, but if you know, if they the world did it for one day, you completely change the world. I mean that's of course idealistic and crazy. But the power of that, if you had eight billion cups one day that gift exchange, yeah. you would completely Eliminate poverty in one day. Uh, it's a crazy concept, which it won't happen, but that's the power of the value chain. Of yeah, yeah, it's so much power in it. Yeah. What, what if somebody is watching this video, wants mm. to do something right now? Mm. What, what is it? Depends on what scale. I mean, we have gift exchange programs that run in the United States. So legally, we're only allowed at this point to do it in the United States. Uh, we could do it in the UK, Germany, France, Norway, Sweden, Finland. Australia, Japan, Korea, uh, there are many other countries that have the same uh, charitable tax laws, meaning if you make a charitable contribution to a you know, community development, yeah. 
a, a registered program, you can receive a deduction. Oh, that. that's not the case everywhere. In not, Switzerland? Not in all countries, yes. What is in Switzerland? I, I don't know about Switzerland. Possibly. We had somebody looking into it. But if they want to do it, it's incredibly complicated and they would have to like come meet us and learn it uh, because it is very, uh, you have to be very particular how it functions because you have to know traceability. You can't just get coffee and gift exchange no? because you have to prove destination of funds. If you just buy this, right, because you would have to buy coffee yeah. and once you buy it, it becomes a commodity. Yeah, yeah. So then you can't claim that it's a pure gift exchange. No. So that's where you have to understand where you get the coffee from, the communities. Do they understand that they're gift exchanging? Are they writing on the contract that we are allowing you to be stewards of our gift? So if they wanted to start in their own country, they could. If they want to just purely gift exchange, they still can. Uh, maybe they won't get the tax benefit, but you can still support these communities that we work okay. with. Um, if you want the coffee, if you don't want the coffee, it's an option if you want the gift. So you let's say you donate yeah. 20 bucks. If you want a gift of coffee, you have every right to say, yes, I want my gift. If you just want to donate, then okay. You don't have to accept a gift. But even if it's like really a gift in that way, mm. it's complicated to allow it. Mm -hmm. Not really. Uh, why but would you think it's complicated? You, you, you told me, it's like I just, not sure. I just if don't it's... know their tax law. I mean, you could, you could do it, but one of the powerful things is the ability to deduct this ah. cost at the end. I mean, it's not important for maybe you, Maybe the tax is not working, but at least this exchange could work. You can work. still do it. So it's just maybe you don't have the, the tax benefit that you would in other other countries. Would you, would, you, would, you, would you do the gift exchange to Swiss interested people? Uh, would you donate, you know, donate? You can. I mean, if there were if there were roasters that wanted to engage in this program, uh, or if, if there was somebody who had the funds and they wanted to start a gift preparation facility, which is effectively a, a coffee roasting facility, if they wanted to start that up, absolutely. This is not, um, this can happen anywhere. I mean, technically it could happen in Latin, it could happen in Vietnam. We have people that gift exchange in Vietnam for Vietnam. Um, All right. So, so it can happen. Uh, it's just the powerful one is when, when we talk about economies of scale and changing these things. Uh, you can start with the small consumer movement, and that's beautiful. Don't get me wrong, it has massive impact. But when you go to somewhere like the United States, and you can do it for, let's say, a hotel chain, or you do it for, let's say, uh, a company, a, let's say a tech company. Yeah. I, for instance, if you had Apple or Google. Maybe said, so someone from a tech company is sure. watching this video sure. now. But I so mean, what if, would you say to him? If Google or, or Apple was watching this right now, and they say, well, of course they have cafes and they provide coffee for their for their employees. They're still buying it. But the consumption of coffee that goes out in these one, one of these companies, the amount of coffee that comes in, not only could they get arguably a much better quality, this is super top tier specialty coffee, not only could they drink that, but the cost of that would be tax deductible because it's a contribution. And not only that, every single cup of coffee that was consumed in that company would in the end be an absolute traceable program. So they'd be like, hmm, this year we built a hospital. And it wouldn't be some obscure thing yeah. where you're like, oh, we donated to this building. No, 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 no. You built a hospital for these people. Or you took 7,000 families out of debt slavery. And it would be like, real, traceable, you. Because we have to, by nature of, of being able to conduct gift exchange, we track and trace everything. We know exactly where this comes from. We know exactly how much it costs, who's relying yeah. upon it, yeah. everything. We know all of that. So when you donate, it goes directly to the people. So every cup of coffee you drink at your company would be making the world a better place. That's and that's fantastic. the whole point. People who are losing yeah. the money, mm. is there a chance that they will uh, be a problem? If it's short-sighted, yes. If they're short-sighted, yes. That, that's what I was trying to get to earlier, but we kind of went off on a tangent, but the idea is we're not trying to replace the entire market structure. What we're trying to do is build safety and security behind the farmers so that they can actually engage in the market in yeah. an ethical relationship. They can, if they're properly diversified, survive off of the market price, even if this was sold at the shit prices that we see today. If they were properly diversified and understood what it was and how to diversify their income and not solely rely upon this green bean, then they can enter the market and have an ethical relationship. There would be no company that would be taking advantage. And there are a lot of companies that don't want to... I mean, I don't know anybody who's really like, yeah, 
let's get it on these phones. Yeah. I've never met a single person, except for a couple loan sharks, but I've never <laughs> met a, a single person in the industry, like especially importing countries, that wants the farmers to be in a, a tough situation. Okay. Hold on. But the problem is um, they have no tools to be able to help farmers in this capacity. That is not their job. Uh, they don't have that experience. They would love to do it, but they don't know how that works. And so it's like, all right, well, what we can do is very quickly incubate and build structure and stability in a community where in a couple years' time, you can come there and buy coffee from them and you will not be taking advantage of them. So we can build an ethical supply chain for the market. Like, we, we shouldn't be in a community forever. That is not right. But when they're strong enough and they say, we actually are strong enough now, we have you know, basic healthcare, or we have education, all these different things that are important to them that they need, and they feel like once that's satisfied, they can re-enter a market, but not struggle, not be under yeah. loan shark crap. They can just get good coffee at a fair market price and be okay with it. But so it, we would not be a competitor with them because we can do the things that they need to have happen if they want to be called a sustainable supplier of coffee. And so it's like, okay, we're gonna incubate these communities for a few years but they'll be able to re-enter the market. So, and we can do it very effectively. It's small amounts of coffee. I mean, imagine that. Um, 36 tons, nothing, nothing. I mean, just in, in Laos alone, you are exporting 56,000 tons. In Vietnam, you're looking at 1.8 million tons. You're talking like 30 tons can change a region if you get to change. 30 tons is nothing when you're looking at global consumption. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about well, what's uh, that Google. It's, Let's it's, look at Google, right? Google will probably consume somewhere around uh, 30 to 46 tons in their company. Only. You like that one company could completely change an entire region. It could change a region of coffee production. But it's, if it's getting if it's getting bigger and bigger and like, we really won't necessarily have to limit ourselves. So. Philanthropy yeah. is a charity where we can never be a large multinational charity institution. All right. But if there is more demand for this kind of things, uh, it would be great to be able to show maybe the next generation that there is an opportunity to yeah. look at entrepreneurship in this light. Sure. Like you can engage in coffee trade. Like following this bean for the past 15 years, going from being a barista all the way to what we're doing now, you touch upon almost every tenet of human life. It's crazy. Importing, exporting, manufacturing, uh, steel production, fertilizer production, soil science, negotiations, contracting. You're talking about uh, even weaving, uh, design. You're talking about food production. You're talking about healthcare. All of these different things, all of a sudden, it's this massive, intricate link to everything. And being able to earn a living doing this, like right now we've been, we've been not really earning a lot because we're waiting for that that big push to happen. But in a in a purely functioning gift exchange program, all the employees of Flampy could earn fifty thousand dollars a year. Now that's not being a millionaire, but if you're smart on your own, you can earn money. You can take fifty thousand dollars and learn how to invest and do other things and generate your own personal wealth. But not on the expense of this. But earning fifty thousand dollars a year, that's a great income. And not only that, I have a home in Laos, I have a home in Vietnam, I have a home in Indonesia, I have a home in India, I have land, like, I'm not using it, but, and granted, as of right now, you have hundreds of hectares of land, I have hundreds of acres that are given to me by the people, in, by them saying thanks for assisting us. Like, I'm extremely poor as a man, in cash terms, but extremely rich in other ways. Um, and I think there's a lot of people that are looking for a relationship to the world like that yeah. and so it'd be like okay when we get big enough to where we can't know the people that we're serving like if I lose touch with the farmers that are coming in here if I can't see them if I can't see the impact if I can't watch the funds the donations work and have the conversations and understand what's happening and if I can't communicate that back to donors we're too big and then you need somebody else to carry the torch for maybe another country another region another thing yeah. so it'd be wonderful to see not only to succeed, but to almost codify it into a way where other people can do this. Because it's a beautiful lifestyle. I mean, if you have even just a little bit of money, this is a beautiful lifestyle. You make human connection on levels that you can't buy. Um, 
it's like it's building this human network of, of all the best parts that you hope that humanity can continue to, to cultivate. Like, it's, a, it's an amazing job and it works for coffee, tea, cacao, rice, spice. It works in the United States, in countries with, with you know, vegetables and organic production. And it, it's just a mindset where you stop valuing things and you start valuing the humans behind them, the humans behind them. Um, so it will grow. Um, and it will take a very specific set of people to do it, but I know they're out there, especially in the younger generations. Like, I'm still a young man, but the next generation coming up is asking these questions. Yeah. What can we do? And you're like, so much. Like, you could see that start to shift. And I think consumers want that because the ones that we, we do gift exchange with, they don't do it once. They want to do it forever. Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa. That's genius. I can do this? Like, yeah, it's all you. And it's like, I didn't do it. You did it. You <laughs> drank the coffee. You donated there. We're a facilitator of the relationship. And I know there's more people that want to facilitate that relationship. So, slowly. Nice. Is there something very important for the end? What, the, what do we miss? Mm, yeah, we could say two things. I'll just be a, a call out to them. But yeah. I mean, basically, it's like that. Uh, coffee is an incredibly complicated, incredibly complicated, historically linked good that has been basically the foundation of trade for humanity across the world, especially in you know the past six or seven centuries. There's a chance where we have a paradigm shift. Gift exchange is an absolute paradigm shift in our relationship with the things that we consume. It's been uh, seven years building this out, and it's strong. Um, we're still not strong enough, though. We, we need support from other people. Um, it could be a small donor, but I'm speaking specifically to those out there who have means and who have resources. If you have anywhere from let's say $150,000 to $1.5 million. And this is, it could be me or it could be anybody else. I don't care how this works, but if you have that, you as an individual have the potential to change the world. It's just money, but that money used in this kind of thing can completely shift a paradigm that has been intricately linked to slavery uh, all around the world. You can change the world. And I mean that more than anything else I've ever said. So if you're out there and you want to do it, it's up to you. Yeah, man. That is a nice last week. That's it. I mean, at this point, fuck it. You know, it's up to them.